This week, uh, we have started with a new book. We have gone into the new book called Leviticus. Pastor Susan gave a brief introduction uh, in the beginning. I almost thought she's going to finish up off with what I have prepared to speak. Um, and I, I was just waiting to I need to just close with the liturgy of Jesus almost. But yeah, that, that's what happens. It should be very obvious that when you look into the scriptures, these are things that's supposed to pop out. But we're going to look at it once again, and I'm, I'm going to try and uh, uh, develop a bit more on uh, my, what she was speaking. But I, this is what I want to say. I'm not going to share anything new. You probably have heard this uh, quite a number of times, but this is what I want to say. This is not for the Torah scholars who are seated here. I want you to share this with a Christian friend today. I want those of you watching, I want you to share this um, broadcast with a Christian friend because I'm going to be probably, most probably speaking to a Christian crowd who do not have a Jewish understanding of the book of Leviticus. I had a very good friend, not had, but still have a very good friend. And uh, she used to quite often uh, challenge me about the book of Leviticus. And this is when I was in, in the church world. And that's why I said this is for most of the Christians, because she would ask a lot of questions about the sacrifices and things like that. And, and then I was ignorant, just as many in the church world are still ignorant. They have no clue about what the book of Leviticus is. So we're going to get into that, and I'm going to try and uh, shed some light for our people. And I, I do know some of you, do take a peek. I do know some of you, uh, uh, what do you say, do come in and do, do hit uh, a view and you have, but if you are joining in, I want you to stick on. You might be here now, you might be coming later on. Not going to give you a word that's going to pump you up, but I do want to shake off some of the dust that probably the Christian theology has brought in upon the book of Leviticus, and you have put it aside saying this is not for us. If you say this is not for us, even as a Christian, I would say you are gravely mistaken. Because if you do not know the book of Leviticus, or let me say, if we do not know the book of Leviticus and the sacrifices that are there in it properly, then I do not think we intend to worship God in its real sense. Now, the book of Hebrew, and the, the Hebrew name for the book of Leviticus is Vayikra. How do we get that name? That name comes because the first, very first word, the name Vayikra, for those who are English speaking, it says Leviticus. But actually, the Hebrew name for the book is Vayikra. And how we get that is because of the first word of the book, and, uh, which, is, which starts with the word so let's just look, take a look at the very first verse. And uh, yes, Pastor Susan also had put this image. But I'm going to show you some more things on the image. I, I did have the Aleph in mind, but there are some more interesting things uh, that we are going to look. It says in Leviticus chapter 1, verses 1, it says, And he called Moses and spoke to him. Did other nigh from the tent of meeting, saying. Now, most of our translations will say something like, and the Lord called to Moshe or Moses. But a more closely aligned translation with the word order in the Hebrew would be Vaikra, which means, and he called. And then it tells us who called and who is called to. And he called Moshe and spoke to him, did Adonai. That would be how more appropriately we can put. We could also put it as, and he called to Moshe and spoke to him. Who did? Adonai did. From where? From the tent of meeting, saying, and then it goes on. Now, the phrase, and he called, is a one word. How easy it is if we can all learn Hebrew. We can probably save a lot of pages. You don't have to use too many letters and words. It's just one word. It's Vayikra. 
I wanted to put that um, Hebrew letters there, but I think I don't have it there. Why ikra? And you will notice something interesting about this word is, which means any call, and like we were looking at before, is the letter Aleph is written small. Like you can see. Can you go to the uh, next image? What is the next image? I seem to be losing. Okay. Yeah, this is the one that you saw before is one that I picked from uh, online somewhere. And this is how you will find it in our Torah scroll that we use. This is the image that is from our Torah score. Here you can see the pointer at the first word of the Levit book of Leviticus, which is Vaikra. And then you see that Aleph is written small and in an elevated position um, up off the line. Now, before we uh, go on, this might be a good time to point out a few things about the Torah scroll which I want to uh, show. Um, can you put the next image? Up on the top, we see this final words, that red mark that I put are the final words of the book of Exodus. This is where we closed last week, the Torah portion. So what happens is on the Torah scroll is when one book ends, you will skip four lines. Four lines are skipped and then starts the next book. That's how we know when you come to a place like this, this is how we know that a book has ended and we are going to go into the next sefer, the next book. You will find no numbers of the book. There are no chapters, no chapter numbers, no verse numbers. There's not even any punctuation or capitalization. You will just see these four blanks, four blank lines, and you know you've ended one book of the Torah and you're starting the next book. Something else you might notice that's interesting is the way the scribe keeps the line. I mean, I don't know when you all looked at the Torah, Torah scroll, what was the first thing that came to my mind? What came to my mind, my mind, was how these, do these scribes keep the line, the, the written thing so straight? And if you will see, you will see those lines. Can you go to the next the thing? I've bloated this up. You, do you see those lines? Those lines are most, uh, you will see, most of you know that these apartments are made up of leather. It's the skin of an animal. Uh, and the Torah store always uses a kosher animal. And so what the scribe does is he inscribes these lines with a bone tool. They make these lines a dent on the parchment so they can get all the lines straight. And then, so yeah, that's how they make the lines so that they can justify and keep the things aligned together. But here's something interesting I want you to know. Now, this might not be very surprising and very new for people here in India, but for those of our friends from the West, probably this should catch your uh, eyes, but I'm sure it's not caught your eyes too. Here's the thing. The, the line, if you notice, do you notice something unique happening in the picture that you're seeing? Just with your sight on the picture that's on the screen, what do you see? Something unique, something different. Let me test your sight. Oh, yeah. It is gap in beams, like the uh, big word, the like neat scene. I uh, don't know, you don't have to get it for all those kind of. It's very obvious things. Let me not hang you in there. The letters, if you see, are not written on top of the lines as we do in English. Rather, the letters are hanging from the line. Why I said that this is not going to be very different for us here in India is because the Hindi language is written. And I was trying to search the Telugu and many others. I think that is also written on the line. It's not writ hanging on and so it's very interesting that these Hebrew uh, scriptures are always in all Torah scrolls. If you can go back to the first uh, image, the very first image, this is from online. You see, it is hanging from the line. Go ahead. 
go further back to the same image, you will see these are hanging from the line. Why is this? And, and then, then I went online to check how is Hebrew written in general. They write it actually on the line. Only in the Torah scroll, you will see they are suspended from the line. Why? Because the Torah, it is to indicate that the Torah is heavenly. It is spiritual. It is to indicate that its foundation is not below. Its foundation is above. So the letters are suspended from their foundation. They rest on the foundation that is above. They did not. Why? Because they, it is to indicate that they did not originate below. They did not originate among men. They were not man's ideas. Rather, it originated from above. From God, who is the giver of light and life. So you do not discard a portion of the Torah or the Bible saying this is a man's idea. Now for all my Christian friends who are listening to me, the moment you step into that line and say these were man-made ideas, you are going into a great error of calling the scriptures, the word of God as that of law. And that is why you cannot learn the scriptures from your printed Bibles because there are mysteries. There are secrets that you will see only in a Hebrew scripture, that too not a printed one. I think the Tanakh, does anybody have a Tanakh? You're supposed to take your Bibles out. I'm t talking from the Bible. Leviticus chapter 1. You will, even in the printed versions, you do not see many of these secrets. I think in the Tanakh it's there. Many of these secrets that are hidden in the Hebrew scriptures. So one, you need to be able to learn Hebrew so that you are able to identify. So when you look at it, you should be able to see and say this same thing missing or something this way or that way isn't it is supposed to every time you look into the into the torah it's supposed to raise a question and i've been talking to the men here what we do after the shabbat after shabbat meal is we sit down and we go through the Kumash and I've, I've said as you go through it you ask questions it should intrigue you it should cause you to think why this and why not like that? Why is this here and why is it not this? Why is it written like this and why not like this? And so when you look into the Hebrew scripts, especially on the Torah scroll, a lot of these things are going to come up. And why? Why is it there? God has put it there on purpose to get your attention. To get your attention. So that you ask questions. So now the question is, why is the Aleph at the end of Vaikra written small like that? I know Pastor Susan gave us one aspect of it, but I want to bring to you another aspect of that concept of that, <coughs> excuse me, of that small letter Aleph there. <coughs> so the word Vaikra, Hebrew, means, and he called, which can also mean, and he encountered. If you leave the Aleph off, it will be read as, go to the next slide. If you, if you read this, now this is not Vaikra. What you read there is Vaikar. By itself, without the Aleph, by itself it means, and he met or he encountered. You can find that word, Kara encountered by itself in Numbers 23 verses 4 where it says, and God met Balaam. God just had an encounter. Or in Ruth chapter 2, it says, Ruth set out and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers and she encountered the part of the field belonging to Boaz. So we could say, we could read this as, and he encountered. But the question would be, if we read it without the small aleph, and he encountered, question will be, what did he encounter? 
that's where you go back and you see the Aleph added. And what it says is that Moshe encountered the Aleph. Moshe encountered, and what does Aleph represent? Moses, you know, and I was, I, when I went, was reading through this and I asked, what? He encountered God? What are you talking about? If this is an encounter with God, what did he have at the burning bush? What did he have when God revealed himself to him as you there were here? What was all that? Wasn't that an encounter? Isn't that an encounter that is recorded? Isn't that an encounter to be fascinated? It, doesn't it give you goosebumps? If that's not an encounter, what are you talking about is an encounter? So if he had an encounter then, then why does Vaikra say that and he had an encounter with the Aleph? This is to show us when you and I walk with God on a daily basis, your encounter with God each time is going to be like it was, it is for the first time ever. When you are walking with God, every time you have an encounter, you're not going to feel like, oh, I met this God before. I know him. But every time when you are going to be walking with God as he wants us to walk with him, every time you meet him, it will be as if you were having a sort of short-term memory loss. And so it's like you did not meet so that every encounter with him becomes a memorable encounter. And this is what we are supposed to thrive for. That every time we come into the presence of God, we wait with him, we need to be longing for an encounter. And if you, when you have that encounter, it should be a unique encounter. It should be an encounter that you would like to put it down and write it as a as a, as a as a note, as a memory, as a journal, that I had an encounter with God, and this was unique. Every Shabbat that we come is supposed to be that new encounter. Every morning when you have, if you have your daily devotional, is supposed to be a Vaikra. It's supposed to be your encounter with the Aleph. Quite honestly, what most of us are living off is on some or even just one of the encounters we had with God in the past. Maybe when we had our salvation experience or we had our healing experience or God saving us in a desperate situation or something like that. Maybe you met him at the edge of the cliff at the time when you were about to jump at a railway track. I don't know. But you had some kind of an encounter. However, we are still trying to live off of that powerful, but yet that one encounter that we had. Why do I call it powerful? Because that encounter has sustained you till now. So it was powerful. Then imagine if you have those kind of encounters on a daily basis, what's that going to do with you? Just imagine you having an encounter with the source of all power, Every day, what is that going to make you? It's going to make you power. We walk into the synagogues, into the place of worship that we have built, like Moshe and the house of Israel built. Magnificent, beautiful, expensive even. And we just walk in because we feel entitled and we feel like we have a private and exclusive relationship with God. And that we are someone very special where the protocols do not apply to us. That's how we walk into the synagogues. Isn't it? We have, it's, uh, this is my synagogue. Just walk in casually. No expectations. No anticipations. No desperations. It's just another form of duty that we are fulfilling. A couple of hours we're going to sit, and if the time begins to pass by, our bodies begin to give us the alarm that the time is 
crossing the, from the usual time. You do not look at the clock, our bodies tell us. Because we are not here with expectation. We are not here with anticipation. Because when you are somewhere with expectations and anticipation, your, your body cannot communicate with you. Your body yields to that, that intense emotion of expectation. It just yields, it just gives in. It, it cannot communicate to your brain anything else because your brain is right now filled with this, this wanting something, an encounter, a desperation in our heart, just like Hannah when she went into the temple. She was not feeling tired or anything or hungry. She went into have an encounter. Now, you will see the beauty of this to be able to fall in awe of God only when you see certain things together. In Genesis 1, God made this wonderful place for God, which is the Garden of Eden. What happened? Man rebelled and gets kicked out of that place that God made for him. And now we have a broken relationship between man and God. Now that is rectified where God asked man to create a Garden of Eden for God. That's how we closed last week. That Garden of Eden was now ready. So in last week's portion, we see God fills the temple with His glory. What happens when the glory is filled? No one is able to enter, not even Moshe. So what does God do in this place that man made for him? What He does is He also makes a space for man. Within the space we created for Him, for God and that, for, that we created for God and then he turns around and tries to make a space in each of our hearts where he can also reside as well. Did Moshe need a temple to go meet with God? No. Moshe Rabbeinu, according to me, had a free card to go and meet with God he probably is the only person who can say, I have breakfast, lunch, and dinner with Hashem. That, that was the relationship he had. Moshe did not need a place, but God wanted to live not just with Moshe. He wanted to live with his people. If he just wanted to live with Moshe, he would have lived, started his life with the burning bush. But he calls him and he says, I want you to bring my people. Why? Because I want to rectify what was, what got broken at the beginning. Now Moshe knew the protocol. Moshe knew it was for the high priest to, who could go into the most holy place and do the service. And so this man who was walking up and down the mountain meeting with God, withholds himself from taking the liberty to enter his presence just because he had just because he had some private personal encounter with God on the mountain. He withholds himself. He doesn't think that his relationship gives him the permission to just walk in. He would not dare step into the realm of familiarity where he felt that he knew God. And that he could go in and come out, do anything he wants, when he wants. What a man. What a man. I don't know if you're getting the heart of it, what hit me. Moshe Rabbeinu has always fascinated me, even as a child, even when I did not know all these things. Just for the fact that he knew God face to face. He is known to be the humblest man in the man in the Bible. In Christianity, you know, we are constantly trying to push this idea of God being our friend. And I, I do not deny that. Yes, that's what he wants to. He wants us to be his friend. He wants us to be his friend. Our friend, and we can go to him, and they want to push this idea that we can go in, go to him any place, any day, any time of the year. It's this idea that corrupts, I believe, corrupts the very foundation of reverence and respect towards someone in authority. As a generation, we have 
As a result, we have a generation that is averse to the very idea of submission and authority. They don't like the culture where there is a door to their boss's cabin which they will have to knock before they enter. You know what is it called now? It is called an open office culture. Where boss doesn't have his private cabin, he sits along with the rest of the uh, thing, and as an employee, I should have, be able to just walk right in to my boss whenever I want and sit with him, talk with him, or whatever. I don't know how to do it. Well, I actually care less what they do in their offices. You can go sit on your boss's lap and kiss him for all I care, but what has always bothered me is how it has infiltrated the body of Messiah. The attitude of familiarity has destroyed any reverence or fear of God in our lives. This, and I'm not, though I call Christians, but I think even among us, Messianics, we've given too much of this idea of familiarity that I know. And so we are on a autopilot mode. We know what is the first song. We know which is going to be the second song. We know what is going to be the next part. We know what's going to come next. And so there is no more. And so I'm not saying that there needs to be. There needs to be an order. And an order is always there. But in the midst of this order, because God is the God of order, in the midst of this order, do you desire for an encounter with God? Or if I ask, did you have an encounter with God today? Did we have an encounter with God today? Moving on. So the, now Aleph is the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet. It's the letter whose numerical value is one. And the name of the, this letter Aleph can also be pronounced as Aluf, which means the master, the Lord. It, is, it often or almost always represents God himself. It is the very first letter for El. It is the first letter for Elohim, Elion, Adil, which means the mighty one. And it's just a letter that has God's name written all over, so to speak. In fact, God's name has the numerical value. Who knows? How, what is the numerical value for God's name? yud heh wav Hey. Yes, 26. And the letter Aleph is made up of three small letters, which is two small yuds and vav, which makes 26. Well, so the rabbis say, now we can actually translate this word vayachar with Aleph as he en encountered God. And I find it very fascinating that in Genesis chapter 3, verses 9, God gives a call. God calls out to Adam, and he says, what is he saying? What does he say? God calls to Adam and what does he say? Where are you? Adam, where are you? But now we see here in Leviticus, again, God calls out to Moshe. Only this time, it's not with the question, but an invitation. It was an invitation. You see, this has always been my father's heart. He loves being among men. He just loves being among men. If someone asks, what's your father's favorite hobby? What's God's favorite hobby? It's here in the book of Leviticus. You know what is his favorite hobby? It's to hang out with men and friends on earth for a barbecue under the open sky. Not inside your sophisticated, modular kitchen. It's an old school where food is cooked up in the firewood. But humor apart, I hope you understand what God's heart behind the sacrificial system in Leviticus is and has always been this. And a Jew always did understand this. He does and he will always have this understood that no matter what happens. A Jew understands God's not a bloodthirsty God. A Jew understands he does not need blood. That's not what he's asking for. 
See what it says in Psalms chapter 50, verses 7 to 15. Psalms chapter 50, verses 7 to 15. He says, Hear my people. I will speak, O Israel. I will testify against you. I am God, your God. I do not rebuke you for your sacrifices, for your burnt offerings are continually before me. I have no need of a bull from your house, nor goats from your pens. For every beast of the forest is mine, and the cattle on a thousand hills. I know every bird of the mountains. Please listen to what God is saying. I know every bird of the mountain. Everything moving in the field is mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you. I would not tell you. For the world is mine, and all it contains. Do I eat flesh of bulls, or drink the blood of goats? Offer God a sacrifice of thanks offering and fulfill your vows to Elion. Call upon me <coughs> in the day of trouble. When I rescue you, you will honor me. It is not God who is bloodthirsty. On the contrary, it is humans who are bloodthirsty. How do you say that? That's what you say, see in the book of Isaiah 59. And I'm not going to read that. He says that your hands are stained with blood. God calls out to his people and says, your hands are stained with blood. So what you see in these first few chapters of Leviticus describes the Levitical sacrificial system. At least it gives us uh, five primary kinds of sacrifices. If you can put that PPT, that uh, you see these five are what you will see. You see burnt offering, which is the old law which is in Leviticus chapter 1, grain offering, the peace offering, the sin offering, and the guilt offering. And if there is any topic that is grossly misunderstood among the Christianity, is the sacrificial system. There are these important things that you need to bear in your mind that the sacrificial system had very little to do with sin. Most people think that the Jews believe, which by the way, they don't. It's not true. That they say Jews believe that they're forgiven for their sins because of the blood of animals. They never believe it. They were never taught. The Torah does not teach. The word of God does not teach them. In Hebrews it says, for the blood of the bull and the goats are ineffective to removing sin. It just doesn't work. They will always realize that most of the sacrifices, as I said, had little or nothing to do with sin. The book of Hebrews was not contradicting the book of Leviticus. Rather, it was upholding the heart of the book of Leviticus and the sacrificial system. Now, Leviticus chapter 1 talks about the whole burnt offering. We can just stick on, you know, if we have to go through these, each offering, it, it can go on. And there's so much. But if I just take up the first one, it talks about the whole burnt offering, the whole offering. First of all, it was volunteer, voluntary, it was completely voluntary. It had, second, it had nothing to do with sin. And it was something a person could do if they wanted to do what? Express their total devotion or rededication of their lives to God. And I would just like to dwell on that for a moment. The Hebrew word korban is from the word verb root, which means to approach. This korban was brought to, you know, <laughs> some people ask, why, why does your God need animal sacrifice? animal sacrifice for their sin to be forgiven. Do you, can you imagine if God had set an animal sacrifice to fix a willful sin, a sin that was committed? What would happen? If just the sacrifice, giving a bull or a lamb would, uh, you know, uh, set you free from your sin. Imagine, if I have to, say, kill Jerry, I just have to calculate, um, one bull is equal to this, and this, this, 
Oh, okay. Yeah. That, that's easy. So I go kill Jerry. I offer a bull. You know, God is happy. I'm happy. Jerry is dead. It's done. God never wanted a sacrifice, animal sacrifice, to let you off the hook for sin. There was none. But what, what were these sacrifices for? These sacrifices was so that you would draw close. If you wanted to draw close to God, this is how, it is like this. It's like um, you, you are going to meet someone or, or you're going to meet your spouse on a date and she says, and you ask, what do you want uh, for this special date that we have? And she says, bring me flowers. Bring me flowers. And you, you are a wealthy man. You have all the money that you want. And so what, you, what would you say? You would say, flowers? Why do you want flowers, dude? Uh, flowers is going to see, doesn't it say, yeah, flowers. Flowers is going to just dry up in two or three days. Why flowers? Let's get something that's more useful. Let's get a tool. Maybe I'll get you a new grinder or maybe an automatic pressure cooker or, uh, or, or something that's more useful at home. That's going to make you comfortable. That's going to make it easy for you. Why flowers? And the wife says, you won't know what gets my heart, what pleases me, then it's the flowers. It's not for you to understand how many days it will remain, how, how long the smell will be there. If you want to get to my heart, this is how you come. You come with flowers. God says, if you want to draw close to me, you want to draw near to me, this is the way I want you to draw near to me. How? I want you to offer a sacrifice. But the question is, what is the sacrifice? Now, one of the most beautiful pieces of the scripture is that the one who was bringing the Ola offering, he was supposed to lay both his hands on the head of the animal. But it wasn't just, you know, lay his hands. Yeah, just touch if we say, lay your hands and pray, you, you. Now I'll get to that also. He just, he should not get a shock. But the laying of the hands was not a light touch. It was in the Hebrew. It speaks of the person pressing down on the head of the animal. Like what he was doing was he would, he would press, he would press on the animal as if he was transferring his identity to that animal. And this is why, I think I have spoken about this before here, that you do not allow any Tom, Dick, and Harry who just calls him the pastor, a, a prophet, or an anointed, or whatever, to come and lay their hands upon you to pray. And nor do you do that to someone. Because what you do not understand is that when you lay your hands and Say, pray for someone. You are transferring your identity. Whatever mixed up things that you may have. Mixed up anointings that you have. That's why you don't just, just because somebody is just saying, come on, come forward, I want to pray for you. Just don't go stand and, oh, please lay your hands for you. You're holy, please lay your hands and pray for me. No, you don't do that. So, in the all offering, he would transfer the identity onto the animal. And what was he doing? He was transferring his inner man to him. And what was offered? What was offered was a bull. As the rabbi says, the, word, the verse does not say, a man of you who shall bring near an offering. But it says, a man who shall bring near of you an offering. The offering bought is of you. It's not an offering from you. It's an offering of you. 
The sacrificed animal is just the projection of who you are. The Talmud says man is a world in miniature, which means that the world is a man in macro. Our world contains oceans and continents, forests and deserts, deserts, men and beasts within all of us. And within us is a human soul and an animal soul. The human soul is also called the godly soul, embodies all that is upward reaching and transcends in man. It gravitates to its source, God. It is to its source, which is God, and is driven by the all consuming love for God and desires to lose itself within his all pervading essence. Its modes of expressions are thought, speech, and deeds of the Torah, the means by which that man achieves closeness and attachment to his Creator. However, the animal soul, soul is the self that man shares with all living creatures, a self-driven and fulfilled by its physical needs and desires. Its vehicles of expressions are the endeavors of material life. This is why we keep saying, do not give in yourself to materialism. Because when you run after materialism, what you are feeding is this animal soul. What you are making big is this animal soul. It does not, it does not help you draw close to God. Who can hear, I'm not saying how much materialism you have, who can hear actually say, materialism has helped me draw close to God. The wealth that I have today has actually pastor greatly helped me come close to God. I was so far away from God. But from the time I've become wealthy, I've drawn close to God. No, he does not. A man who shall bring here of you an offering to God from the beast, from the cattle, and from the sheep, you shall bring close your, your offering. When a person brings an animal from his paddock as a gift to God, the gesture is devoid of meaning unless he also offers the animal within himself. It doesn't matter which is the finest bowl that you got from which is whichever the finest market you could, as most expensive as it could be, but if it did not bring the you along with that sacrifice, it meant nothing. So if you've been reading the Torah portion, the process was that whoever wants to come close to God would bring an offering. And then what happens? And then what happens? Uh-oh, Pastor, we did not read the Torah portion. Okay, we lay our hands on it. We transfer our identity and then? Uh, but before blood, what happens? Blood just comes out? It's slaughtered, right? Who slaughters it? Wrong. You did not read your Bible. It's the offerer who slaughters it. It's the priest who sprinkles it. And that is why the dying to the self is your job. Not God's job. Not the pastor's job also. Not the priest's job. It's your job. So the Qurban offering here, it says that you will bring yourself and you will slaughter it. Like Romans chapter 12 says, to bring an offering, what offering? As a living sacrifice, that you will bring yourself as a living sacrifice. And so the beast that is, that is offered up, the beast within man has not been placed there just so that it should be suppressed or uprooted. Please understand this. It is not put there on the altar 
so that it is suppressed. I'm going to suppress this, this, this beast that's crying out. It's craving for <coughs> gluttony so much. That's craving to go into, uh, into the pub or into the club. The idea is not to suppress or approve. Because if you need to understand, much grave is produced with the might of the ox. An ox can run amok, will trample and destroy, but when dominated by a responsible human vision and harnessed to its paw, the beast vigor translates into much grain, a far richer crop than what human energy alone might produce. The same is the true, same is true for the beast that's in the man. Nothing, not even godly soul's keenest burning can match the intensity and vigor with which the animal soul pursues its desire. Left to its own device, the animal soul tends towards corrupt and destructive behavior. But the proper guidance and training can eliminate the negative expression of these potent drives and exploit them towards good and godly ends. So the first type of the Qurban describes in our, described in our Pasha, which is Ola, the ascending offering commonly ref- referred to as the burnt offering. The burnt offering where no one gets anything. Everything is burnt. The entire animal is burnt into smoke and ashes. And someone would ask, why so much a waste of money? And you know what God would say? You don't have to. I never said you have to. It is never demanded. It is not compulsory. You don't have to come to the synagogue. You don't have to say the prayers. You do not have to keep the feast. You don't have to follow God's calendar. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to pray. You don't have to read your Bible. But he says, if you want to draw close to me, you've got to offer yourself. And when you offer yourself up, it will be a complete offering. The Ola offering is unique in that it is an absolute offering. After it is slaughtered in the temple courtyard and his blood is poured upon the altar, it is raised up upon the altar and is burnt in its entirety as a fiery pleasure unto God. So when this animal is offered upon the altar as a whole, not just the animal, but the animal takes she on your identity and you have come along with the sacrifice and you offer it upon the altar and then the whole thing is burned and the smoke comes up. It says it's a sweet aroma unto God. When? Not when the animal is killed. The animal in itself, burnt upon the altar without you attaching itself to it, without you coming to offer, God turns his face away and says, I don't want this. I don't want this offering. It's no different today. You can can bring in the best Musicians in the world, you can bring in A.R. Rahman, no offense to A.R. Rahman, he's good. You can, give me some names, Justin Bieber, you can bring in the Zakir Hussain or whoever, the best musicians. And you can offer up an amazing, flawless music and singing up into the heavens and God would go, or leave them, leave Zakir Hussain and all. Let's just state ourselves. We can beautify the sound which we have been doing for 
so many years now trying to make the best, bringing the best instruments, bringing the best technology, and cause us to raise up a, you know, more synchronized and beautiful with beautiful violin playing or good drums and all that. And God says, if you are not in it, if you are not the one who is trying to approach me, come close to me with these that you are bringing, is just noise to my ears. And I do not want. I do not want. God is asking, do you want to draw close? If you want to draw close, then what's required is a sacrifice. And that is your sacrifice. And that's why Romans 12 says, it's offer your bodies. I urge you therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your music, your songs, your prayers. Is that what it says? It says, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service. And it's very fascinating if you understand that an animal was offered upon the altar and it was offered, it is dead. So, you put one firewood or ten firewood, it's just dead. It's not going to go anywhere. The offerer doesn't have to worry about the animal just getting up in the middle of the sacrifice and just walking off and saying, oh God, my sacrifice is gone. But Paul says, now offer yourself as a living sacrifice. Offer yourself upon the fire. Offer yourself upon the altar. And when you are upon the altar, a couple of pieces of wood might increase and the fire may increase in intensity. And when that fire of the situations of your life increases, the intensity of the heat increases, the situations and the people around you causes that heat to, the flame to ignite more, flare up. Yeah? How we say sometimes, situations just flare up in the office. That's the fire that flares up. Now you as a living sacrifice, what are you going to do? Are you going to submit yourself to God and say, God, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to be here because I've decided I want to draw close to you. I want to come to you. And so I will sacrifice myself. And so when Yeshua gives a call, and he says, if anyone wants to be my disciples, my disciple, what were they supposed to do? Right. They next. Do you know what Yeshua was talking about? Yeshua was talking about the Ola offering. He was saying, if you want to draw close to me, you've got to become an Ola offering. You've got to become someone who would die completely. There is nothing about you left anymore. Because if you're going to come to God, and there is within you left your agendas, there is within you left your ideas, things that you want to accomplish, your dreams and your visions, then it is not a sacrifice acceptable and to God. And it's very interesting that in us, among us, there's different kinds of animals. Right? So God says, bring a bull, a lamb, a turtle dove, different types of animals. In some of us, there is an ox. Some of us are a goat. Some of us are a sheep. Whichever it is, God says, I want, to, I want you to bring that animal to me. Do you identify the animal that is hiding within yourself? Do you identify yourself with that animal? 
What we do not understand is if this animal is not identified. And I, and one of the examples that I give is electricity. The power source that's generated, wherever the power station is, uh, and, and all countries have their power generating source. And the power is generated. And just imagine you let that power source just run wherever it wants to run. What is it going to do? It's going to destroy. It's going to burn the entire place down. And so that massive source of power has to do what? Has to submit itself to go through stations, various stations of various levels of transformer where this massive power is reduced and reduced and reduced and reduced and reduced and reduced and reduced, and reduced before it can become this. Before it can work like this. It can work like those beautiful lights. Isn't it beautiful? Aren't these lights beautiful? They are. But have you seen the source that lights this up? It's dangerous. In you and I is that potential of that power. And so he says, bring it to the altar. Not to be suppressed or rooted out. He says, bring it to the altar. So that this ox, this beast of a man that is within, can be trained, can be tamed under an authority that is set by God and attached to a paw, attached to a yoke, and plow this hard ground. For what? For what? Huh? Say it out. For a great harvest. There is no harvest if a beast does not surrender itself to a master, to a human with a vision, to an authority which has a vision. But when it does, what it does is it becomes an old offering unto God. You want to build the kingdom of God? You've got to become an old offering. You might be great, Mr. Great or Mrs. Great, wherever you are. But when it comes to the kingdom of God, he says, I want to completely be you dead. I want you to come as nothing. So Yeshua says, if you want to come close to me, you've got to deny yourself. You've got to deny and let me ride on that animal. Let me ride upon that animal. Let me tame it. Let me tell you where to go. Let me tell you what to say. Let me tell you what to do. And when that is done, God says there will be a great harvest. Great harvest of what? Souls. Great harvest of souls. You know why we don't have souls in the kingdom today? Because, you know why? Where we do you know why? <laughs> Some of you are laughing, so you know why. Why? Yeah. Bulls don't want to work, but that's not just the problem. His bulls are going and make, they are making a havoc. They're destroying. They're destroying souls. They're destroying people. They're destroying the harvest. Because this bull inside is not tamed. And so the book of Leviticus is here to remind us once again. And align and join with the very words of Yeshua and say, 
if you want to come close to me, I want you to deny yourself. I want you to sacrifice yourself. So, I want to come close to God. What do I do? Draw me close to you. Never let me go. I lay it all down again. God says, enough of these words. I don't want your words. And I have said this before also. I forget the name of the writer. He says when God looks at the worship of the man in today's day and time, he probably has this to say. In the multitude of your words, where am I? In the multitude of your words, where am I? For you cannot deceive me by your words when your, when your heart does not please me. In the multitude of your words, where am I? He doesn't want our words. You can be silent for all he cares. But if your heart is clinging on to God for an encounter with God, then it is acceptable. Then it's an Ola offering. What have you brought today to offer unto God? Your money? Your tithe? You think he needs your tithe? You think he needs your money? Do you even think he needs your time? No. Let me tell you, he does not need your time. He does not need your money. He does not need your talent. He does not need your skills. He does not need your muscles. He does not need your brain. He does not need any of these things. What does he need? Exactly, Ravi. You. He needs me. Why? Because when I come, he knows when I come, along with this comes everything that I've spoken. So a lot of us get away with just, I've given my money, I've done the charity, I've given my time, I've been here on Shabbat, but we miss the point. He's asking for an Ola offering. He's asking for a complete offering. He's asking for us to come as a living sacrifice, as a whole. We are trying to bring our children, we are trying to bring our uh, family, our spouses. No, he says, Leave them. Leave their hands. Leave. When you bring the boy, don't bring the, the kid and the wife and the husband and everything along with it. No, just leave them. You come. And you bring yourself and offer up on the altar. That's how we prepare. That's how we get ready. That's how we draw close unto God. Not by putting on the best clothing and now here I am, I'm going to the synagogue to offer up myself. I was getting ready this morning and I was imagining, just, just imagine, I'm getting ready to go and offer up myself. No, you've got to be offering yourself. You have to have lived a lifestyle that has denied yourself then God is pleased Amen I pray that we will understand and there's still more to go in the other offerings that he talks about you know it talks about the grain offering it talks about the thanksgiving offering it talks about these offerings when are they brought there are this the offerings are bought when you fulfill a wow, you know. And I was thinking how, how just imagine how we have come to a time where, where we, we, we are fearful even making a wow unto God. Because we are not sure if we will fulfill them. We are not sure even if we will fulfill those vows. We are not people who say and we do. There's so many things that we have said before God, I'm going to do this, I'm going to keep this wall, I'm going to fulfill this, but none of them are fulfilled. Peace offering. There are so many to go through, to study, to 
search out and understand God's heart. This is God's heart. Do you know that Vaikra is the book that is given to a child to read? First book to read when they get into their age of studying of the Torah, which is some say three, some say four, some say five, but it starts somewhere around there. And this is the book that is started, that is given to them to start. It's not the book of John. It's not the book of Genesis. It's not the book of Revelation. It's not even Psalms. It's Leviticus. It's the book of Leviticus, which you and I call, oh gosh, it's so gross. So much of blood. You know what the sages say? Sages say the book of Leviticus is the most pure book in the entire Torah. And so the child's soul which is, which is pure and not defiled by any of the defilements of this world can begin to read this and take on the purity that the, that the book of Vaikra has to offer. You know why you and I look at the book of Vaikra and say gross because we've been defiled by the grossness of this world. Because we have blood stains on our hands. And so we cannot see the book of Vaikra the way a child looks at it. And so when a child looks at it, he doesn't see sacrifices as killing an innocent innocent animal. They say, why kill an innocent animal? And so, um, I think Rambam, in, a, in, in his work called The Guide for the Perplex, he says that these sacrifices were given to his people by God in those days based on what the, what the surrounding people were doing so God gave them these sacrifices. But then he goes on, later on, he, he goes on to say these sacrifices are laws without reason. And I like what, what somebody said. To, to the heart that is perplexed, it is only fitting that you think that these sacrifices were only for those days. Because you are never going to understand. You're never going to understand the real heart of this matter if you're a man of perplexed heart. But if you're someone who wants to draw close to God, then you will look at the book of Vaikra and know these are laws without reason. I do not reason with it. I don't need to reason with it. I do not understand everything. This is what God wants from me. This is what I will give. This is what I have to offer. These are laws without reason. And so when a child of pure heart of the age of three and four looks into it, he does not see a lot of blood and animal. What he sees is this, oh, this is how I draw close to God. This is how, when I want to come close to God, this is how I come. Amen. I pray. That in the season that we are, we would desire to draw close to God. And we will take upon ourselves the calling. It's the calling. It's the calling from God. It's the calling to sacrifice yourself. It's the calling to deny yourself. It's the calling to put yourself on the altar. It's the calling to not withhold for yourself anything. But you give up and say, here I am Hashem. I want to be a living sacrifice unto you.